let's get real. Welcome to TBC Today. This podcast features friends in and around the Triad Baptist Church community. Hear encouraging real life stories from our weekly guests and inspiring insights from our host, Pastor Rob. To learn more about Triad Baptist Church in Kernersville, North Carolina, visit us online at tbcnow.org. We've got an exciting episode for you today. Can you believe it's October 1st? And this is the second episode of our second season. So thanks for listening or watching. Uh, Make sure that you like it, follow us, share it with a friend. Uh, Our guest today is Pastor Jason Schuler, and uh, he is our Missions and Family Connect pastor. He actually wears several hats here, and we may talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, An interesting fact is I've known Jason probably since he was really little, I was his high school teacher for many years. Uh, We have some great memories. How does that Uh, make you feel, by the way? It makes me feel really old. (laughs) I just wanted. The thing is, the thing about Jason is, when he was in high school, somehow I got sent to the principal's office (laughs) more often than he did. This is where we should start. Those are stories we won't talk about on uh, this episode, but maybe on another episode. But great guy, married. Of course, most of you know his wife, Desiree. Uh, She sings in our church. Is very involved, and they've got three kids. Yep, got a little kid and. The newest addition to the family. That's right. Yeah. A little dog. That's, yeah. We have <laughs> so, a dog that keeps us on our toes. For so sure. we're going to get this conversation started with Pastor Rob. He'll flip the timer. You ready? Let's get real. <laughs> All right, Jason. It's good to have you here today. I'm glad to be here. And uh, I can't even, I didn't know you well in the early years, so I've known you for a lot of years, but it really has been the last uh, probably three or four years that, that I've known you. And, um, uh, you tell us a little bit about just, uh, okay, you finished up high school mm-hmm. uh, here in this area in Walkertown at Gospel Light Christian School. Yep. And then where did you go from there? And tell us a little bit about your life and bring us up to date. So at Gospel Light, we had the unique opportunity to have a lot of Christian colleges come and present in our chapel and high school. And so we had one called West Coast Baptist College in Lancaster, California. And that was attractive to me because... I thought California seems awesome. I would love to go to college 3,000 miles from home, uh, <laughs> get away and do my own thing. And they, the promo video that, that they would show about California was it would show Santa Monica Pier and the beach and you know its proximity to Disneyland. And it was just a great place. It's like, man, how cool would this be? I thought I was going to UCLA based on the video <laughs> that they showed. And so um, I went to visit the campus, and it was not at all like that, but I still thought the proximity was pretty close. It's an hour and a half from all those things. And so Lancaster is on the edge of the Mojave Desert, and I went there with a commitment to go for a year. Um, Kind of the way that I was raised was you give your first 10% to the Lord, you give your first day of the week to the Lord, why not give the first year of your adult life to the Lord? And so I decided to go to West Coast. I was committed to going for one year. And toward the end of my freshman year is when I met Desiree. We started dating, and I ended up staying for all four years. And so I graduated with a degree in church ministry. So it's like a theology degree from Bible college. Um, And that's where I went post high school, is I went straight to Lancaster, California. My first job was there, working under Carrie Schmidt in the youth ministry for a year, which was really cool, and then wanted to go into youth work. And I did that for about six years. And then I really did it up until I was sick of pizza and Mountain Dew and all-nighters. And so I was ready to do something else. And so I kind of have a multifaceted now how did you job meet, uh, How did you meet Desiree? Well, that is a very interesting story, and I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> so at the time, my, one, of my, one of my friends was very interested in dating her. And so the first night that we met, it was on the sand volleyball pit, And so we met, we talked a little bit, and I went back to my dorm room, and I told my roommate, I said, I'm going to marry that girl one day. And he said, are you talking about the girl that so-and-so likes? And I said, is that the same girl? And he said, yeah, it's the same girl. And I said, oh, okay, well, this guy was a friend of mine. And so over the course of, um, I guess, the next couple of weeks, she and I would talk, we would hang out, we were friends, and basically I said to the guy, I think you ought to ask her out. And he said, why do you think that? And I said, because if you don't, I will. And he didn't, and I did, and we've been dating ever since. So that's kind of the story of Why us. didn't he? Did he just... I don't know if it was... Um, maybe he didn't think she reciprocated those feelings, or maybe he was intimidated of her or of me. Or I don't have... You. Me, I don't know. He didn't. And so I did, 
And how many we years have you been married now? We have been married twelve years this oh, past man. June. It's hard to believe. Now, ministry yeah. wise, was did she go there to be in ministry, or she just she did. went there? Yeah, she, she did? did, and she studied music. And I mean, what did you me, tell her? What did you tell her you were thinking about doing? I liked youth ministry, mm-hmm. and I felt like pastoring could be in my future. Uh, but I I liked youth ministry right out of the gate, just because I saw that as something that was. Um, a way that I could earn income, still have ministry experience, and then hang out with kids. And in the early days, man, I loved those youth activities, all-nighters, teen camps, youth conferences. It was great. And then after about five and a half years of doing it, I was ready to do literally anything else. I did not want to do youth ministry, didn't want to do ministry in general. And so, um, you know, to all those youth pastors that are out there that are watching this, God bless you and your ministry and stick to it if that's what God's called you to do. I think it was a good season for me. I think I learned a lot during that time, but I would not do it again. So if you're looking for a youth pastor ever again, don't consider me. I think the guy that we've got is great. So So you left out a youth ministry, and how long was this into your ministry? Um, I had done, I did youth ministry for about a year in California, Mm -hmm. and then I did youth ministry in Oklahoma for five and a half years. And then when we left, we moved to Colorado, and we lived there for a year and a half and really didn't do much ministry at all. I think I was open to doing some ministry, but really in the beginning, uh, didn't want to do ministry, wanted to try other things. And so I got into real estate a little bit. I worked for uh, United Airlines. I worked on the ramp for a while, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but the you know you have no um, seniority, and so I was up against guys working for schedules where guys had been employed longer than I'd been alive, and so there's no future in that for me. But I did get some free flights. So got, I was gonna say you got to fly a lot, right? Yeah, and I got Ethan, to go to. Little, that's right. Real, so little. Ethan and I went on a couple trips. Yeah. One time we flew to Casper, Wyoming, just because it was a direct flight from Denver to Casper, Wyoming. And we flew there, and we got off the plane, and we got a snack at a vending machine, and we got back on the plane and flew back (laughs) to Denver, Colorado. And so it was free. So if nobody, if I could get on standby, I did. I went to Boston one time by myself and went to a Red Sox game at Fenway Park. I went to California. I took Desiree to Arizona and California doing that. So I got a lot of free flights, and it was a lot of fun. But the pay wasn't great, and the schedule was the worst. And so I could not do that long term. I did it for a while. I were did. You, um, uh, were you at that time like trying to figure out what you wanted to do with your life? Like you said, yeah. you knew you didn't want to do youth. Yeah. So were you just trying things or were you just trying to survive? I think it was a little bit of both. I think survival was definitely part of it because it's like at the time I was married and we had two kids and Denver's not a cheap place to live. It's not like you can just wing it and survive. In yeah. that area. So the cost of living is a lot higher. So really, I was just doing what I could to get by. And I was still interested in the ministry. And I reached out to a couple churches, and I had other churches that reached out to me. And it was ironic because the churches that I reached out to about working there, they were not interested in me. And the churches that were reaching out to me were places I was not interested in working. And so there was a time when I had about four or five different offers during that season. And none of them were attractive to me, to our family. And so we just passed on all of that and just waited for a door to open. So what brought you back to Kernersville, where you grew up? Well, what brought me back here was I think the cost of living was the main thing. None of the jobs that I had were sustainable. And I was looking to get into maybe selling life insurance. And I thought I can do that from anywhere. And the money that I make is going to go a lot further in the triad area than it will in the Denver, Colorado area. And so we looked at the possibility of, you know, moving. And I flew from Denver to North Carolina to look at houses back in October, I guess September of 2016. And then we moved here in October of 2016. And the main reason was... We knew that we wanted to be able to have our own house, which we didn't have in Colorado. We were living with my in-laws. And we knew we wanted to be able to have our own house, do our own things, and the money would go a lot further in North Carolina. And we wanted to be close to family. So we lived with Desiree's family for about a year and a half, and then we moved here to be closer to mine so that the money could go a little bit further. And that's when I started. I worked for my mom at Schuler Healthcare for a little while. I started selling life insurance, and I was doing both of those at the same time back around the time that we started visiting here. So really, I mean, what I understand, uh, 
is you were really in that process of time right before 2016, 2017. You were making a philosophy shift too. Not only just maybe I don't want to be in secular work, or maybe I do, but also in terms of the way you were going to do ministry if you did ministry again. Tell me a little bit about that. Like what was going on in your mind? You had to be in this battle in your head about who am I? How do I want to minister? Tell me some of that. Yeah, I would say it was definitely a little bit of an identity crisis for me because I got saved when I was a teenager. I started preaching when I was a teenager. I went to Bible college and was preaching there, and then I went straight into ministry. So my adult life, really, I I think I preached my first sermon when I was 14 or 15, and that's what I did up until I was 27 years old. And at 27, it's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be a part of the church that I was a part of. I don't want to go as hard as I've gone. I don't want the burnout to be an issue. I don't want family to be... Um, you know, taking a back seat to the ministry. And so I stepped away from all of it. And there were times during that process where I thought, okay, if I'm not a preacher, who am I? If I'm not a pastor or youth pastor, who am I? Mm. And I started trying to just reevaluate who I was um, as a Christian, as a husband, and as a father before I ever looked at the pastoral thing. And I think, you know, sometimes we get involved in ministry and we're just headlong, full speed ahead, full throttle. And it's easy to forsake the ministry that you have at home with your spouse, with your kids. And I think that's something I was guilty of doing. And so after five and a half years in youth pastor and the year before that in California, it was like I've done this six and a half years and I've preached, you know, for the last decade or more of my life. Is this what I want to do? I don't want to preach and do ministry at the same time that I feel like I'm forsaking my first ministry, which is at home. And so really during that time, it was a paradigm shift for me where I began to focus on my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my kids, and ultimately my relationship with the Lord. Uh, And I feel like it's easy for that to get put in the back seat when we are when we're so focused and driven. You know, I was an ambitious person and, and still am, and I, I say yes to probably more than I should. And so because of that, um, something has to be a no. And oftentimes it was my family that took a back seat. And now I think it's been a paradigm shift for me where that is priority to me as opposed to ministry. And, and that's good. I, I like that. I like that. How, you know, who am I? I'm not, you know, I'm not just a preacher. I'm not just trained to do that. But, you know, I am a husband. I am a dad. And how's that going to fit into my life? Uh, you also made a philosophical shift with us. Like mm-hmm. we were a little less conservative or maybe more liberal. I don't know how you'd say it. But you could use either way. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's all in what you want to <clears throat> say, but I could, I could say So either. what day did you wake up and you said, you know, I'm open to that. Like, I'm going to go in that direction. Is there something that triggered in you that said, hey, uh, I think I'm going to move this way and not that way anymore? Yeah, I don't know if there was a particular day when that actually clicked with me, I think it was a process over about a year and a half from leaving the ministry we were in to not doing ministry at all. And so I was, so I have a preaching log, which a lot of preachers will do on where they were, what they preached, you know, title text, all that. And so in the five and a half years that I was doing youth ministry, you know, I was preaching every Sunday morning, some Sunday nights, um, every Wednesday night, a couple times on Saturdays, Um, and then every time our pastor was gone, I would have a preaching responsibility. So I was clocking, you know, 80 to 100 preaching opportunities a year when I was 23, 24, 25. And so, you know, if I were to look back on my logs, you know, it would be like, you know, 75, 83, 112, 4, you know, in 2015. (laughs) And it's like, so uh, it was a total shift for me, and I just realized that if this is what the ministry is, I don't want any part of it. And I think a lot of that comes from the ministry that I was in that was, um, Mm -hmm. I think there was a part of it that was unhealthy. And maybe it wasn't unhealthy for everyone, but it was unhealthy for me. And when I stepped away from that entirely, I thought, okay, let's strip all the tradition away. Let's strip all the nuances away. Let's go back to the basics of what does the Bible say? What have I actually been called to do? And I think when you strip away all of the periphery things and you go back to the heart of what the gospel is and what you're required to do as a believer, um, you kind of lose those nuances and traditions. And so I think for me, once over a period of about a year and a half, all of that was stripped away and it was like, okay, 
I do think I'm in a healthy place. I do think I'm ready to get back in ministry. What does ministry look like to me? When I looked to get back in, it looked a lot different from my perspective than it had a year and a half earlier. So I don't think it was an overnight shift. I think it was a period over about a year and a half that made me think, okay, this is the direction I believe God wants me to go. And you know, I was always a little nervous of that. Like, even when you joined our church, I said, now are you sure you want to come to Tri Baptist Church? (laughs) You did the same thing to me, too. And then I'd I'd go to Jerry sometimes, is he sure he wants to go to Tri Baptist Church? You know, and uh, really, I I couldn't get in my mind, you know, because when I looked at uh, somebody like one of your brothers or something, I was like, well, your brother could easily do that. You know, I could see your brother just jump and ship. It was just an easy step for him. But for you, I was always cautious. Yeah. And then then it got where you were starting to teach Sunday school. Mm-hmm. I think I even had you doing some Sunday nights. And then the next thing you know, I'm like, I think I could create a position out of him. So I took you out to lunch again. And I said, are you sure this is who you are? Yeah. You know, I had to know in my own mind. And so it was a real battle in me. And I really started to be convinced there after about a year into ministry. So five years in, how am I doing? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think he's I almost adapted. there. I think he's almost there. Getting closer. <laughs> so by 2017, you're working part-time here, which quickly evolved into full-time, and it encompasses everything from upward sports to our connect groups, our small groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big thing right now that you're doing and working on is our missions and revamping that program. I've been here almost 10 years, and so out of all the years that I've been here, it's been really neat to see how the missions program has sort of taken spotlight we've and has never shaped had, up and it is so had. organized it's in and um you want to talk about that for a minute we've got a missions conference I, this is a good time to do a commercial right <laughs> we've got a commissions conference on sunday october 3rd if you're listening to this before the third make sure you come on sunday morning it's going to be fantastic we'll probably talk more details about that in a few minutes but tell us about your heart for missions and how you you jumped into that yeah, so the, the missions program at Triad has really evolved over your tenure here and even before that. And really, uh, a lot of what I inherited with the missions program was due to Dwayne and Linda Cross, who were veteran missionaries um, Great to, yeah, to Chile and Colombia are the two primary fields they were on. And when they retired, they had family here. They went to Triad and plugged in. And as veteran retired missionaries, they poured themselves mm-hmm. into our missions program And so when I took the reins from them, I got to work with them for about a year and a half in missions. When I took the reins from them, uh, it was all organized and it was all smooth. And I I just can't help but think it's not like that at all other places. And it hasn't always been that way here. And so they really, you know, Linda gave me, you know, here's the password for this and here's the notebook and here's this and here's that. And I was so overwhelmed. I couldn't believe you asked me to do that. You know, I was like, great, now I got one more thing to do and it's missions. And uh, but I I love missions. And so I, I did not go on a missions trip as a teenager. My first missions trip that I went on was in 2010. I was 23 years old. I had been married for a year and I was a youth pastor and I took 28 people to Romania. Hmm. which is not a great wow. idea. I would not recommend any pastors out there send a 23-year-old youth pastor and his wife with 28 people to a third world country, and he's never been on a trip before. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But I went, and it was crazy. Everything worked out. We didn't lose any passports. We didn't lose any kids. We came back, and it was great. But that was the first missions trip I ever went on, As we flew into Hungary, and then we drove over into Romania. And that was such an impactful trip for me. And ever since then, I've had a desire to travel, to go on missions trips, to be an encouragement to missionaries, to preach in other countries, and just to see what we have. America is so far from being perfect, but we are so far ahead of the rest of the world with what we have and the way that God's blessed us. And so I I love working with missionaries, missions program. I use WhatsApp, and I have missionaries reach out to me all the time on there. It's so cool. I can just text people all the way around the world. And I had a few come in just, just yesterday and this morning. And so it's, it's neat to keep up with missionaries. And I think a heart for missions is something that I really began to cultivate in 2010 with that trip. And over the last decade or so of my life, it's just kind of amplified. And even so, even when you started here, that was you had actually three areas of ministry. You were over the recreation, mm-hmm. you were over our connect groups, and you were over missions. And we kind of tagged on missions. And I think that was the least liked of all the ones you did. You liked yeah. the connect group, then yeah. the recreation. But then as I've watched you over the last few years, it has totally shifted to missions. I mean, yeah. that's all you think about and, and concentrate. I mean, you do the other jobs you have to do, yep. but I think your passion has grown so much and you've really brought an element to our church that I don't think we've ever had before. Yep. 
So it's kind of cool. Just got a text for a missionary just a second while you're saying that. So yeah, I think it's dominated my life because, you know, we did Upward and Rec and that was great. That was kind of my foot in the door. And then I started teaching the Home Builder Sunday School class. And then I did the Sunday night. And then we moved to small groups, which was huge. And then you're like, hey, why don't you do missions as well? Which is really coy, by the way, to just tag something on. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I'll have I'll have a that's side him. salad and that's a... For you. <laughs> let me get a side salad and just a, a side of green beans. And let's just add on that 14-ounce sirloin. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Well, that makes sense. We'll do it that way. Well, tell us quickly, how many missionaries, uh, domestic versus international how many i don't think people know it's it's uh yeah. shocking to me it's huge to know how many missionaries and how much money we're putting into well that by the year. time this episode airs um you will see our new missions hallway which is going to be yeah, really good exciting. for people to be able to see the countries that we have missionaries and who those missionaries actually are but really it constantly changes we have missionaries that will retire uh, we have missionaries that come off the field for various reasons, and then we're all the time trying to take on new missionaries. So at present, at this moment, we have 77 missionaries that we support. That's missionaries and missions organizations, yeah. and that's local here in our area, that's domestic in the U.S., and it's foreign. And our philosophy with missions really is foreign church planning missionaries. Mm -hmm. We have some church planning missionaries that are here in the States, but really Almost all of the foreign works that we support have a have a concentrated focus on church planting, which is the heartbeat of our church. We're looking to plant churches. We're looking to see churches planted and help church plant. So we have 77 missionaries and missions organizations currently that we support, and that represents about 36 different countries. And so what are some of the uh, things that you do in missions and the trips you've been on? Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. last year we went to Mozambique and South Africa, which was cool. We got to see a couple missionaries. We saw a missionary in South Africa, and then we saw two missionaries that we support in Mozambique. And that was actually right before the world shut down. In fact, when we were coming back from that trip, the day that we left Johannesburg was the day that they got their first case of COVID in that country. And so, you know, we were really about a week or two from being stuck in South Africa. And you want to talk about anxiety. Imagine being <laughs> stuck with him in South Africa. Talk about joy I mean, be for awesome. a couple months. Yeah, yeah. You well, I'll let you go listening, on the, you can't see the I'll let you go on the next face. trip then. But we went on a trip to South Africa, Mozambique. This past year, we went to Togo. We took a group of five to Togo, which is in West Africa. It's such a small country, but we actually have three missionaries that we support in that small country. And a lot of that is ABWE over the last several decades has had constant missionaries in and out of Togo. And so they have a big work in Togo. Um, and then this Sunday, the 3rd, I'm going to announce where we're going on our next trip. We're actually doing a survey trip. My wife and I are going to two countries in the next couple of weeks. And one's going to serve as a survey trip for the trip we're going to take next summer. And then I hope the other country will serve as a trip in the future. But we want to do a foreign and a domestic trip every year. We want to allow people in our church to have the opportunity to go on these missions trips to see our missionaries. I get invited to missions trips from good organizations all the time where I don't know, I don't know those people. I don't know those missionaries. We don't have any part of their works. But our passion in our missions program and our philosophy is we want to go on missions trips to see missionaries that we have supported for years or that we're supporting to see where are our missions dollars going. Um, how cool is it for us to be in Mozambique and to see, you know, some things that our church had a hand. We took up a big offering for a lot of the ministries and the things they're doing in Mozambique, uh, one of which was a goat farm. And how cool was it yeah. to to have a palestra and a, a, a opportunity to meet these national people sitting under a tree, sharing the gospel, hearing their testimony, sharing ours. And it's like, hey, we helped sustain this goat farm. You know, how cool is it that we yeah. had a hand in this? And so, you know, when you go see other missionaries and other places that you don't impact, um, it, it doesn't do as much as saying, hey, I give to missions. This is my church. You're my missionary. And now I'm coming to see you. It's a big deal for us, but it is huge. Huge for the and, missionaries. We and see. to the thing that most impacted me is how elemental it was there when I was there. Yeah, the elemental levels that we sat around on dirt floors mm -hmm. in mud huts, and literally they talked about the concept of being saved, and then what is baptism about? Yeah, and that was the whole focus. And for like an hour and a half, we talked about baptism. Yeah, and I'm like, they were just realizing when they made that statement of baptism, they were risking their life. And that's where it was different than where we experienced. But I just saw they were like little children soaking it up. 
Yeah. And what a what a powerful thing. And then using a goat farm to reach somebody for Christ. It's incredible the ingenuity and just the cleverness of yeah. their approach to missions. So those are the kind of things that set me on fire for what some of our home missionaries are doing and some of our foreign missionaries are doing to reach people for Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it totally alters your perspective. Cause like when you said about baptism, we think about baptism, you know, the cliche is, well, it's an, it's an outward display of an inward decision. It's like, well, that's great. You know, let's get baptized. And here in America, it's like, it's like a party. People get baptized yeah. in mm-hmm. pools and people get baptized <laughs> all over the place in the States. But there, you know, these are people, a lot of them that we were talking to about baptism had made a decision for Christ, but baptism was literally the thing that they were most afraid of because they are publicly identifying with Christianity as opposed to Islam or as opposed to whatever they grew up in. And a lot of those people, they do lose their families. They do. It's a, it's a society where the father-in-law yeah. has a lot more pull than the father. So, you know, there were men in that room who their family, their wives, and their children had been taken by their father-in-law because they had been baptized and because they publicly identified as a follower of Jesus. And we don't understand that here. But that's why some of our trips are so important is because it gives you a perspective that you can't get anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, that is so true. And it not only gives you that perspective, but then it changes you. Hmm. I think I'm in the ministry, and one of the big reasons is is because my dad had me go on mission trips when I was 17, 18, 19. And I really think it... I saw a, a third world country mm-hmm. and I saw the rigor of what those people face and just the burden you see for the need of the gospel. And so that's what's so uh, moving for me, for you to do your position, ignite passions in people for foreign missions, domestic missions, and just get them uh, so excited. There's not a person, I think, in our church that has gone on a mission trip with our church and has not come back changed in some way. I mean, you heard it from... Uh, that one girl you took, um, Suzanne. Suzanne, yeah. yeah. And uh, just, you could see it. You could see the passion mm-hmm. from her and just yeah. the excitement of what God did in her life and her heart. And so that is so cool. And I think you've got a great uh, position there and a great ministry to be able to do that in people's lives. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that work with us. We do a, we have a missions committee meeting. Right now we're meeting monthly. And so we've got about eight to 10 people who serve on our missions committee. And really what they do is we meet, we talk about missionaries, we pray for missionaries. I share a missions devotional from a missionary, um, you know, in years past that we can learn something from. We actually started something new this year where in our meeting we do a Zoom call with a missionary mm-hmm. live on their field. So we talked to Daryl Burnett as a committee this past week, but we've got several we've done that with and we'll talk to them live just for about 10 or 15 minutes. They'll give us an update. What ways can we specifically pray for you? And it's an encouragement to the missionary to know, hey, here's some random group of people that I've never met that are meeting on a Sunday afternoon, and they want to talk to me, and they want to pray for me. And that's such a cool thing. So we do that, and we've got several that serve on our missions committee. We've got a couple slots opening uh, this year for our missions committee. So if there are people that go to our church that are members that are interested in serving on our missions committee, we are looking to fill a couple more slots. But we take on new missionaries. We sift through missionary applications. We invite missionaries to come. Uh, we check support levels, who's doing good, who's struggling, who do we need to raise their support, what trips do we want to go on. So it's it's all missions for the time that we meet, but there's a lot of people that contribute to that atmosphere as well. Well, listen, Jason, we're running out of time here, but uh, just is there anything you would like to say or cover before we do close out uh, as far as missions or anything else? Because you've emphasized quite a few things, but yeah. is there anything else you want to cover or say to us? I think one way that people listening can get involved, <clears throat> even if you don't go to our church, you can pray for missionaries and you can give to missions and you can go on a trip. And especially for people that are a part of our local congregation, that's what I would tell you to do. You can serve missionaries like by coming to a missions emphasis like we're having this Sunday. That's going to be huge uh, for people just to get a perspective from different missionaries. One of the things we're doing this year in our missions emphasis is Paul Davis, the president of ABWE, is going to be with us speaking in both services. All of our Sunday school classes are going to have a missionary, and we're inviting missionaries, um, some that are foreign that serve all around the world, some that are local, and then some that are right in our backyard. For instance, the Winston-Salem Rescue Mission, 
a representative from Love Life, a representative from Salem Pregnancy. All of those are going to be with us because we support all those ministries. They're going to be with us in addition to other ministries serving. And so one thing you can do is just show up. You can pray for missionaries. You can give to missions. You could serve and then consider going on a trip, you know, because that's really, like you said, that's how the perspective changes is when you go on a trip and you see something you've never seen before. I think that's very cool, too, that we support missionaries in our own community. So, you know, some churches are more all international or all community, but we do both. And I love Mm -hmm. that. That's one of the things that I love. I I just want to go back 26 or 27 years with you when you came first came to try it as the pastor. How has your heart for missions evolved and how has the missions program evolved over the past 26 or 27? Have you you seen an increase in giving and prayer? Oh, yeah. I think there's, oh, I can't even tell you the hundreds of thousands of dollars that has now been given to missions. But when I I had a vision for it in, in right around 2000. I remember thinking one of my goals in the next 10 years is going to be to get a full-time guy who, who is going to promote missions. And that was, a, you know, I never saw it being Jason, but that really was my passion is to really see that. So in the beginning, we were just doing support, but now we're doing support in a whole different way. We're not just giving money. We got sidewalk counselors working with uh, sale and pregnancy, and we got ladies out in the field uh, preventing or trying to draw women to not have an abortion, and it's effective. And they're they're texting me, one one child saved today. Wow! And uh, awesome. just the impact of seeing uh, women come yeah. to Jesus Christ then too. And so those are the kind of things in a local way, but in a larger way, I think we've created a passion for missions in a way that I'm I'm very proud of. Yeah. And the money is just a small piece of it. Yeah. It's the changed lives that I think has been the most impactful to me as a pastor. Wow. It's incredible. Uh, he mentioned, you know, like Love Life and Jason mentioned Crisis Control. We we do donations here every Sunday for Crisis Control. There's a lot of ways that if you don't want to go on a missions trip or you don't want to be on the committee, yeah. that you could just support, give, yeah. serve. All of that's found on our website, tbcnow.org. I would encourage you to check out the webpage on missions. I would encourage you to check out our outreach ministry pages on our website. And then I would encourage you to check out our connector hallway, which we've just revamped for missions. Jason mentioned that. And we've got a lot of information out there. And I think it's pretty phenomenal to be able to see, just to visually see what we're doing and what we're supporting here at the church. So I think that's pretty incredible. It's great. Okay, well, why don't you close us out, Jeremy? All right. Well, it's been a great episode. Jason, thanks for being with us. I'm sure we'll have him back to talk about some of the other roles that he does here and more of his story. Maybe we could do some funny stories sometime. Uh, he's a pretty funny guy. I like the one in the airport but, he had, the one coming back from uh, one of his trips. And the guy says, I forget it all, but it's just so funny how he's making a deal with him, giving oh, yeah. him a granola bar, basically. Oh, yeah, for, no, that's, you ought to tell that. That's great. Can you do that? Do you want me to tell it? 30 seconds, yeah. Yeah, just I, take a short time. Quick version. Okay, I'll do my best. So... We were trying to get out of the country. We were in Togo, and I bought these bookends that were solid wood, and they were in my carry-on because I didn't want to check them. I didn't want them to get destroyed. And a guy says, you can't take this on the plane. And I said, yeah, I can. He goes, no, you have a weapon in your bag. And I said, I don't have a weapon in my bag. Show me the weapons. He pulls out this block of wood and said, you could hit someone. You could kill someone with this. And I said, no, 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 it's for books. He said, no, 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 this no good. You can't go on plane. And then he said, I, I talked to my supervisor. So he goes and talks to his supervisor, which is, I'm pretty sure, just another guy. And he says, I, I am your friend. And if anyone ever tells you in a foreign country that they're your friend after trying to shake you down, they are not your, <laughs> your friend. friend. <laughs> and I said, uh, I, he said, I am your friend. I'll let you go. Do you have something for your friend? And I said, yes, I have something for my friend. And he said, what do you have for your friend? And I pulled out a protein bar that I had brought with me in case, you know, because you go to Africa, you never know what the food's like. I didn't want to starve, and I didn't. So anyway, I had this uh, protein bar, and I said, this protein bar, peanut butter, make you very strong, very good, 12 grams protein. He said, it's good? I said, it's very good. And he said, it's okay. So I give him the protein bar. He says, I'm good to go. Well, Suzanne, who also went with us, I said, what about my friend? This is my friend. Can she come? He said, no, no, she have weapon in her bag. I said, come on, man. We, there's no weapon in the bag. And he said, you have something for your friend? And I said, I have two protein bars. So I gave him a second protein bar, and he said, it's okay. It's okay. You go. So we got to go. So the moral of that is know who your friends are. People international probably are not them if they try to shake you down. And always take protein bars when you take travel internationally. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, thanks for listening. And, uh, again, we would love to hear feedback from you. Let us know what you think. Like this episode, share it, follow us. You can watch it on YouTube. You can listen to it on your favorite um, podcast platform. And we hope you have a great week. We'll be back with episode three in a couple weeks.
Thanks for joining us this week on TBC Today. We want to connect with you, so make sure to visit our website, tbcnow.org, and subscribe, rate, and review the show in iTunes, Spotify, or Amazon Music. Don't forget to share this episode with a friend and be on the lookout for our next conversation.